you have your manuals, you can turn to chapter 9, page 30. We're going to be going over the characteristics of a warrior. <clears throat> By the end of today, we should be into the principles of warfare, uh, which we will be discussing in some detail. <clears throat> in the beginning here, it says characteristics of a warrior. There are many warrior characteristics, but essentially, as far as we are concerned, the essential characteristics of a warrior are found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 which are simply these. <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. <clears throat> that means that you can have all the joy you want. Right? There's no law against it. So that's good news. Right? Now, <clears throat> but there are also two other characteristics that are essential in the life of a <clears throat> spiritual warrior. Number one is discipline. Number two is perseverance. If you have those two characteristics, you will win. Right? You will survive. You will accomplish. You will move forward. <clears throat> the aspect of discipline and perseverance are the two... Um, <clears throat> you know, you look at the other characteristics, the fruit of the Spirit, obviously uh, those are important, they're fruit of the Spirit. The difference is that they come out of the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit in you, then these characteristics should be obvious. They should be developing. And now you can work on them, but even if you're not purposely working on them, if you have the Spirit, they should be coming out. So when we talk about discipline and perseverance, those are two that you have to work on, that you have to decide that you're going to function in. <clears throat> Winston Churchill uh, made the famous statement, and he said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never give in, right? Um, <clears throat> actually, I understand they have a new movie coming out about his life uh, that looks like it might be pretty interesting. I'm not sure how detailed it will be, but uh, he was really an amazing character, and I actually have a book on him about his uh, relationship with God, which might surprise you that he actually had one. Um, because <laughs> some of his uh, characteristics might not uh, think that he did, really. But uh, he talks about it, and his main, uh, uh, his main encounter with God was while he was um, uh, actually in battle, and he talked about how God literally came to him in, while he was in this battle and directed him in the battle, and he came out unscathed. And from that time on, he was moving toward God, um, through Jesus Christ. He actually mentioned Jesus Christ. So and so it wasn't just a, some type of spiritual experience. Now, <clears throat> over the next page. Now, just because we're going through these quickly doesn't mean that you've heard it, you know it, let's move on. It means that we are trying to lay the foundation so that as we, even when you leave here, you've still got to go back in and develop these characteristics. What we're showing to you is how important these characteristics are. And honestly, as we just said, the two most important as far as uh, winning battles, winning spiritual war, is in uh, discipline and perseverance. And that's one thing you will find in all people who God uses greatly, they will have discipline and perseverance, always. And you'll see it, they will uh, persevere against overwhelming odds, they don't let things stop them, but they also have the discipline in their daily life to do what needs to be done, to read scripture, to pray, to spend time with God, to all, all of the disciplines that we mentioned earlier, they work those into their life where that becomes their life. And so if you're going to be used greatly of God and win spiritual wars, then you're going to have to get these disciplines in your life. It's just, there's just no other way around it. Now, now we're going to start talking about some of the basic principles of warfare. <clears throat> and we will go through these and explain them but uh, and tell you how to detect them. Now, the reason we're going into this, and these are um, not just these, but also all of the uh, principles of warfare in general are taught in all of the major military academies. They should be taught in all of the Bible schools also. Mm -hmm. And because our spiritual war is more real than any physical battle somebody might have. <clears throat> so we need to realize that as we go through, there are generally, generally accepted nine principles of warfare. Now, we also have... Uh, delineated five ways that the enemy attacks. And so these are slightly different, but they play into each other. So you'll see the difference. So remember, there's five ways the enemy can attack, and then there are nine principles of warfare. The five ways of attack 
could also be used by yourself. So all of these principles are neutral in the sense that you will either use them against the devil or the devil will use them against you. Now, in some cases, you're both using the same principles against each other. And then it comes down to you recognizing and having the discipline and perseverance to continue and to actually be able to know what he's using against you. And really what it comes down to in the final, you know, uh, how can I say, final analysis of the situation, how quickly you can recognize what the enemy is trying to do and how quickly you can adapt to that situation and apply the principles of warfare against him will determine how effective you are in winning the war. That's really what it comes down to. He's always using principles against you. You should be using these principles against him. But at the same time, you will also notice that since you both have basically the same principles, the difference is we have intelligence. I'm speaking in military terms like military intelligence, which when I was in the military, they said that was an oxymoron, that there was no such thing as military intelligence. But it says that uh, for us, we have the intelligence of the Holy Spirit that can inform us of the enemy's tactics. We see this with the, in the, even in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the primary means or primary um, benefits of the Old Testament to us today is that we can go back and look at the principles of warfare because those principles are still true. And we can see what the enemy does whenever uh, <clears throat> uh, Israel was fighting against the, the uh, pagan king and every time the king did something, Israel would ambush them or they would tell them, you know, they would, they would mess up the attack. And finally the king said, we've got a spy in our camp because somebody is telling our enemy our plans. And one of his guys said, well, no, king, that's not it. Actually, they have a prophet. And the prophet, and God tells his prophet, and the prophet tells their king everything that's whispered even in your bedchamber. And so then the king says, okay, well, we got to go capture that prophet. Now, that makes no sense. <laughs> okay? Because if the prophet is knowing everything the king's saying, he knows he's coming. And that's exactly what happened. And so uh, we need to realize that even in that, that we win. And so the, the point there is we can know what the enemy's doing. And so often, and, and this is what, okay, I'm going to try to bring all this together for you so you can see the, the importance of this. <clears throat> the enemy's tactic, okay, I probably should, maybe even want to write this down. You might want to just make a note. The enemy's tactic is clearly shown to us out of Mark chapter 4. That whenever you hear the word, the enemy comes immediately to steal that word that was sown in your heart. So you know when you hear the word of God, you can know the enemy is immediately going to come to try to get that word out of your heart. Now, the way he does that is, for example, if you hear teaching on healing, the way he's going to try to steal that word, he's going to try to hit you or somebody else around you with sickness. That's what he does. He doesn't come and say, well, that's not true. Because if you can see it clearly true from the Bible, that's not going to work. Instead, he will try to make you sick. So you will wonder, well, if that's true, why am I sick? And so he gets you warring against yourself. And so he, he comes to steal that word. Now, one of the ways that he does that, and one of the things that you find in Mark chapter 4, is a word there called the cares of this world. The cares of this world, the word cares, literally means distractions. The distractions of this world choke out the word, right? You get so wrapped up in the affairs of life, which a good soldier does not get entangled in the affairs of life, right? So you can see how these scriptures come together. So he comes and tries to get you distracted, if he can't get you to just forget it and drop it and move on, then he will try to get you distracted to where you don't have time for it. And when that happens, then it gets choked out. What the, when somebody gets choked out, that means that they gradually lose life or consciousness. That's what happens. The, the cares of this world, the distractions of this world, choke out the word, which means it, you gradually lose consciousness of the word and you get further and further away from it and you just forget it. And whenever you have forgotten it, he has stolen it from you. Now, that knowing that, and this is the, the essence, all distractions of this world are geared to make you weak through him stealing the word that's in your life because it's the word in your life that gives you strength. 
right? Because that's what you fight with. That's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, what you fight with. So he tries to come and take that out of your life, and he gives you these distractions so that you get busy, and then whenever the problem comes that you had the answer to, you get defeated because that answer has been choked out of your life. God gives you the answer before you have the problem. He always does. He always gives you the answer. That's why what you hear today, you may not need today, but you will need it soon. Why? Because he knows. God knows what's coming into your life. He knows what the enemy is planning. Now, here's the problem. Most Christians are so distracted in their day-to-day -day life that Christianity is just something they do. They go to church on Sunday. You know, maybe they remember to read their Bible sometime during the day, something. But Christianity is a, a, an afterthought, almost. Now, if you ask them at any point, say, are you, know, are you a Christian? Do you love God? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. You know, are you hot or cold? Oh, I'm hot. I'm hot. I'm hot on fire for Jesus. You know, well, when did you read your Bible last? Well, Sunday. Well, this is Wednesday. Are you really hot? Right? See, it's that kind of thing that people don't recognize. But the problem is they get so wrapped up in their day-to-day -day life. They get so entangled in the affairs of this life, which a good soldier doesn't do, as we've already said, that they're so busy... Well, and, and I'm putting all this together, so I hope you see the overall picture of this. They get so busy in their day-to-day -day life and fighting their day-to-day -day battles that they fight battles now. And the problem is they can't even think of tomorrow. You know, they don't even think about battles down the road or anything else. And we're not supposed to worry about them because Jesus said, you know, don't, don't worry about that. Tomorrow's got enough problems of its own, right? So we know tomorrow's got problems because Jesus said it does. Am I right? And then people get shocked when there's problems tomorrow. And Jesus already told you there's going to be problems tomorrow, right? And so, but the problem is, is that we, we get so wrapped up today, and yet the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, He will show you, the Holy Spirit that is, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. But we're so wrapped up in the problems today, we're not even thinking about asking Him to show us the future. But if, now notice, if He could show you the future, He could show you where the enemy's going to try to attack two weeks down the road and you can already plan your defense and you can sidestep it where he can't even make that attack. Amen. That's what this course is about. That's why the, what this seminar is about is teaching you to learn from the Holy Spirit, to engage the Holy Spirit and allow him to show you what the enemy is trying to do and you will recognize it through principles. Now, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are geniuses. <laughs> any, any debate on that, all right? They are geniuses. Amen? Amen. And remember what we said yesterday. One of the signs of a genius is that they can spot patterns. The Holy Spirit knows the wiles of the devil. He knows the tactics. He, he knows all these things that the enemy tries and he spots the principles and he spots these, these um, as we would say, these patterns. <clears throat> and then he relates that to us because his purpose is to guide us into all truth. And he is going to lead us and guide us into this truth. And his job is to be there with us as a helper. Okay? And literally, you know, we have this little word helper. But if you go into the Greek for that word, it's a long Greek word. It's made up of like three different words put together, with, which the Greek language is really good at doing. And it literally means one called alongside to take hold of together against. Now think about that. That's what the word helper means. One called alongside to take hold of together against. What that means is he is called alongside of us to help us take hold of the situation and to help us fight against the situation that we're in. You get that? That's his job as a helper. But notice he is a helper. He's not the doer. So he can't help if you're not doing. So if you're not engaging the enemy, he can't engage the enemy because he's the helper. He comes alongside to take hold of together. As you take hold of, he takes hold of. If you don't take hold of, he really can't take hold of. Now, he can warn you. He can show you these things. But we also know how he fights through us. A lot of it, this, this is the reason. See, most people use tongues when they're in the middle of a crisis because he can pray in a way that, for things that we don't know how to pray. But we have to realize that the tongues should be praying to offset what's coming. Amen. You see? 
<clears throat> that's what Jesus, that's how he lived. He lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit to know what was coming. And that's why he did things exactly the opposite. Now, here's, if you want to get a good picture of Jesus' life, think about this. <clears throat> Jesus, if you just read the stories, he did things that made no sense. Right? Oh, Jesus, everybody is seeking you. Everybody wants to hear you preach. Everybody's looking for you. What does Jesus say? Let's go to the other cities. I got to go there to preach too. Jesus, I just told you, we got a great revival breaking out. You don't leave when the revival breaks out. That's, that's a, <laughs> Jesus, you got to learn Revival 101. <laughs> Revival's breaking out. We stay here until it starts to die. Then we leave just before it dies. Right? And then, then we're not a part of the death. We just had a great revival. And so he says, uh, oh, everybody's looking for me. Everybody wants to hear my words. Good. That means we've stirred them up. Now let's go to the next city. Now, what was he doing? Now, see, that makes no sense unless you realize he was out of sync with the way that the world sees things and he was actually doing the next thing. So what, what looked like was weird in, you know, in how he did it was actually he was prophetic in that he stepped into the next phase when most people would have stayed in that phase. What was he doing? He was moving on. He, he lit the fire. He didn't need to stay. People heard. If everybody's coming to hear him, that means they've already heard him. Right? And that means the people that have heard him can tell the other people that are coming. They say, well, where's Jesus? Oh, he left the other city. Oh, man, I missed it. Well, listen, I was here yesterday. Here's what he said. That's, that's what he wanted. He didn't want to be the one that always had to say it. He was trying to train disciples to say it for him. Do, do you see that? And so he was moving, he was out of sync, out of step with everybody else because he was stepping into the next thing while everybody else wanted to camp in the now thing. And so many times, if you follow the Holy Spirit, you won't do what everybody tells you you should do that makes sense. You will be doing the next thing because he's showing you things to come and you're sidestepping. Jesus knew if I stay here and the people come, pretty soon they're going to be trying to name me king. And it's going to short circuit everything I'm trying to do. So I've already preached. I've left it with them. People can share. I'll go to the next city. I'll keep lighting these fires. So when they finally do kill me, I will have done all of this. Jesus went to approximately 175 cities within the area of Galilee. That, that's what they know existed during that time. And he said, we have to go to all of these cities. And, they sent, and he sent them into cities. And we know that at one point, I mean, he had 70 others that he ordained. And he sent them out two by two. So we know at that point they were going to 35 cities. They didn't all go to the same city. So there's 35 teams going out to 35 different cities. And they went around to the different areas. And so what happened whenever that 70 or those 35 teams got finished with those 35 cities? They went to 35 more. Right. He, and you can see they went out, they came back in. But over a period of time, they covered at least 175 cities and villages that were in Israel at that time, were in, in the area of Galilee specifically. And so when you start to look at how he, if you just look at, if you just read what, he, what it says he did and just take it at face value of, okay, this is what he did, then you don't see the strategy behind it. Jesus didn't come here, and, and I, want, I want you to understand because there's, I'm going to say things that almost sound like they contradict each other, but you have to understand what I, what I mean. You have tactics and you have strategies. OK, a strategy is what, almost like what we would call a vision statement. A tactic is more the mission statement. OK, tactics are what you use to get your strategy done. And so we have to realize that what Jesus did, Jesus had a strategy and he had tactics. OK, his strategy was that he wasn't just wandering around. He had a strategy to go to these cities. He had to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he had a strategy to reach Israel. But now notice his tactic is how he accomplished the strategy. So if the strategy was to reach all of the cities and literally to just go from one city, you know, or I should say to reach all the cities and get them all there, then his tactic, now, as I just said, his strategy was to, it was a, um, it was a well thought out plan. All right. His tactics was that he just wandered around. So in one sense, he wasn't just wandering because he had to go to all the cities. But on the other hand, he was just wandering because it wasn't like he had a certain appointment to be here then. And, and had, now I got to go over to this one and that. No, he wandered. Actually, the scripture, the word used uh, that he went about, the word went about there literally means to wander around. 
and literally, if you take it to its fullest extent, it means with no set, um, how was it? With, with no set schedule. And so he wandered around. So that's the tactic. And now, okay, this, we're going to dive right into this kind of get back over here in the manual in just a minute. You have to understand his strategy was to win Israel, even though it wasn't going to happen. So that means he still had to preach to all of Israel. His tactic was to go from city to city. Now, why didn't, now, do you think he sat down and said, all right, look, guys, um, all right, make a list. Uh, we, now, give me, give me, let's get a map and let's get a list of all the cities and let's, let's just start checking them off and give me, okay, now we're going to go here first and then tomorrow we'll be over here and then uh, two days after that, it'll take us about two days to reach here and we're going to make this list and this is the order in which we're going to go to the cities. He didn't do that, right? Do you know why? Because his tactic was to just show up. They didn't know where he was going to be. Why? What does that do? It throws the enemy off. If he doesn't know where you're going to hit, he cannot prepare a defense. Do you see? His tactics was much, and his strategy was well thought out. He didn't just do things hit and miss. Do you get that? So he had an overall strategy, but his overall strategy, his strategy was to go to each one of these cities. But there was not a tactic that said, his, his tactics did not say first this one, then this one, then this one. His, his strategy was go to all of them. His tactic was hit them in surprise attacks. Because here's what, now I, I, we've experienced this. We went to, um, I'll give you a couple of examples real quick. We've, when we were, uh, well, we still travel and do DHTs and everything, but when we first started, there were some things we were learning about this aspect. We went to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, first off, well, we went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and then we went across the country out to Spokane and that area, and then we came back to Texas, and then from Texas we went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And we were in Jacksonville, Florida. We went there first, and people invited me there and said, come out, and, but it wasn't a full uh, three-day DHT. Basically, in the beginning, before anybody knew what the DHT was, people would call us and say, can you come out for a Sunday service? Can you come out for one night? And so we'd say, yeah, we'll go out there. Well, I knew what they were doing. They were testing me. They were seeing, well, let's bring him out. Let's have him for one service. If we don't like him, that's it. If we do like him, we can invite him back. And as I told you in the beginning, we got a lot of invitations one time, right? <laughs> uh, we, did, we, <laughs> we didn't get invited back to a lot of places. Well, in this, in this one place where we went, they invited us in. We had tremendous service. I mean, it was amazing. People coming out of wheelchairs. Uh, I mean, pain and stuff leaving while people were just sitting in the audience while I was teaching. I'm talking about just every, during the day, just teaching. Not even praying for anybody, nothing else, just things happening. It was amazing. And so whenever we finished, the pastor said, this was amazing. We want you to come back. When can you come back? And I said, well, let me check my schedule and we'll see. And I think we had it scheduled for like six months later. That was the earliest we could get back. And I said, I can come back in for this time, for the three days. If you want to preach on Sunday, I can. But right after that, I've got to leave again because we've already got some other stuff scheduled. He said, great, put it in. Let's, let's do this. So we came back home, came back to Texas. And he said, um, we started putting together the plan and said, okay, we've got to go back out there in six months. And so we got it all worked up, put it on the website. Should have been a great meeting. We go back out there. First time, man, I mean, you, you couldn't stop the miracles from happening. Second time, it was like wading through mud. I mean, it was the most ridiculous thing you'd ever see. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff happening. Cameras falling over for no reason. You know, just the, one of the legs of the tripod just, and the camera just goes over, just falls down. Lights going out, flickering. And you know, it's bad enough that they just go out. It's even worse when they flicker, <laughs> right? And it's got, and I was in Cape Town, a different story, but I was in Cape Town one time preaching and I'm, I'm in this building, and I can look back, and everybody's facing me, and I'm looking toward the back, and right at the back where the uh, breaker box is, I see smoke. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm seeing smoke, and I'm kind of watching it and seeing, if, okay, am I really seeing smoke? And, and it gets heavier, and it gets more smoke and more smoke, and it's not making a sound, but it's just smoke. And all of a sudden, flames <laughs> came out of the, and I'm looking, and I'm like, and, and I'm, I'm, I, think, I think I was teaching a DHT at the time, and I'm like, so fire. And everybody's like, fire, fire. I'm like, no, fire. And they're like, yeah, fire. Right. There's a fire on the wall. And they're like, yes, it's all over the building. I'm not kidding. 
<laughs> and finally, somebody turned around and looked, and they yelled, Fire! <laughs> so everybody looked at them, and then they saw the smoke, and then everybody started to panic. I'm like, no, don't panic. Just somebody put it out, you know? Some <laughs> Things that don't happen in non-charismatic churches. Right? <laughs> so, but anyway, that had nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But anyway, so, but I do remember that case. So, but we were, when we went back this time, we went back to Jacksonville. Man, it was, I mean, all kinds of stuff were happening. People were fighting, arguing, and, you know, in the congregation, people that came in that hadn't been there in a while, and they were fighting amongst each other, and just, it was just ridiculous. And, and when it came, now when it came time for healing, there were some healings that took place, but it sure wasn't just the, just, you know, the overwhelming things. We had to actually try. We had to actually force some things and actually do some warfare. And so when we left there, I thought, man, that is, you know, that is so different from the first time we went there. First time we went there, man, it was, you know, I could have done anything and there would have been a miracle. You know, and this time we had to fight for everything we got. And so I started looking at that and started analyzing. I'm like, then I started realizing, because I remember when I went to Africa, uh, first time in 97, and I had a situation with a lady there that uh, had, she had been a Muslim. She'd converted to Christianity. And then because of family pressure, she pretty much went back to, to Islam. And uh, she, when she went back to Islam, all of a sudden she literally went into a catatonic state, just like a trance and just didn't do anything and couldn't talk or anything. And so the pastor asked me if I would go with him to pray for her. And I said, yeah, well, let's go over and pray for her. So we went there. And when I got there, uh, she, we knocked on the door and the pat, nobody answered. And there was, she was supposed to have somebody there with her because she couldn't come to the door. And so we knocked on the door. Nobody came to the door. The pastor said, you wait here. I'll go around the back and see if I can find somebody there. So he went around the back. And right after he turned the corner, that door opened. And there was this little woman standing here. She's about this tall and elderly, really, really small. And she opened the door. And it was a strange thing because she said, come on in here, young man. You can wait in here. I said, okay. So I went on in. And then when I walked past her, and I, I went over and I was going to uh, sit on the couch and wait. And as I did, she started to walk out the door. And immediately I knew, and I can't tell you how I knew, it had to be by the Spirit, but immediately I knew that's the woman we're supposed to pray for. And so I jumped up and grabbed her. And when I grabbed her, I pulled her in. And if you know me, that's not my nature <laughs> to reach out and grab people and do that kind of stuff, generally speaking. And so, but I grabbed her and I pulled her around. And when I did, she moved around by the couch where the couch was. And she sat down on the couch and the table they had was a little bitty table, a little, little short. And I was, and she went around behind it and then sat down. And then I was standing in front of it. And all of a sudden I saw her eyes turn red. I mean, red. And all of a sudden she started sliding down the couch and she didn't, you know how people just slide down the couch? That didn't what she did. She slid down the couch and she started sliding down the floor. And so I jumped over the, the coffee table which again, isn't how I normally act, <laughs> but I jumped over the coffee table and whenever I landed, her, her legs were right here and she was going this way and I literally landed here where she was sliding down. I grabbed her and I pulled her back up on the couch. And whenever I pulled her back up on the couch, she looked at me and, and just kind of started freaking out a bit. And so, you know, you have that split moment where you're thinking, God, I hope I'm right. You know, <laughs> you know, you know I, hope, I hope this, because you know, this is not proper, you know. And I start looking at her and I'm like, in the name of Jesus, you come out of here. And she started telling me, she goes, we know who you are. We know all about you. You can't beat us. We know you. And, and, the, and the, but the, one of the first things she said was, they told us you were coming. And that's what stuck with me. And, but I'm in the middle of it. I'm not thinking all these things. I'm just like, and I hear what she said. And I'm like, and she said, um, they, they told us you were coming and, and we know how to beat you. And I'm like, and I, because I'd already grabbed her and pulled her up. And I said, you can't beat me. And you, you, I said, you, can't, you couldn't beat Summerall and you can't beat me. And because that's where I'd learned that stuff from was Dr. Doc, Doc Summerall. And all of a sudden I said, now you come out of her in Jesus' name. And just started yelling. And she, then all of a sudden her eyes turned back normal. She straightened up and she started crying. And about that time I, I stepped back a little bit and kind of hit the coffee table. And I was going to step out of the way. And I, when I turned, the pastor was there. I don't know how long he'd been there. But he was there, but he sure wasn't saying anything. But, but he was standing there. And this woman jumped up and ran to him and started talking to him in Swahili. And so I started talking to her. And he said, Brother Curry, she, she doesn't understand a word you're saying. And I said, yeah, yeah, she does. No, she doesn't speak English. She only speaks Swahili. 
And I said, she just talked to me in perfect Texan. <laughs> All right? Because she said words like, y'all, and come on in here, y'all can wait. I mean, just, it, and then I started realizing that wasn't her talking. You know, I, my lightning fast brain just kicked right in there. And so, <laughs> you know, but then, but right after that, and, and then I realized these, these devils had a communication system because they, the devils where we had been, this is, this is my first time in Africa. The devils where we had been in America had communicated with the devils in Africa and told her that we were coming or told them that we were coming. And so we had all of this going on. And so after that, I started realizing the situation. So now whenever I was in Jacksonville, I realized that's why we had such a hard time the second time. Why? Because the devils, the first time, it was a surprise attack. The devils didn't know any, they didn't know what was coming. Nobody had told them. No other devil had told them. There'd been no communication. There is a communication system within uh, hell, you might say, or within the demonic realm, just as there is within the, the spiritual realm for the Christian. But, and they communicate amongst themselves. But the difference is, in the spirit realm, we are, the, the angels and that bring messages and do those things, those, they communicate and they all work together and there's harmony. But in the demonic realm, there's no harmony. They don't work together necessarily unless they're commanded to. And so generally, they, they, there's a whole lot of uh, envy and strife and all that kind of stuff going on. And there's a, a jockeying for position in the demonic realm where demons try to get stronger over areas. And they, so they fight amongst themselves. That's why the demonic... That's why Satan's kingdom can't stand. It, it's fighting against itself. And it doesn't work together unless it is commanded to, usually because a higher spirit oversees it all and says, no, you get your act together and start working together to defeat this common enemy. And so there is a, there is a ranking and a structure in the spirit realm. And that's when I first learned that. So I thought, okay, that's what happened. But that was happened in 97 in Africa. And then this happened in... Uh, 2001, 2002, I guess it was, so I think 2001, that uh, all this happened in Jacksonville. And so I started noticing these things. So then we started saying, okay, because up to that point, we didn't really pray ahead of time for meetings. So then we started praying for meetings and started saying, okay, it'll be this way. We also learned about weather and about dictating how the weather would be during meetings because we would go into a place and I, before I got there, it was supposed to be you know, horrible and bad weather and all this. And whenever it's that way, Christians read that and they don't show up at meetings. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's kind of the opposite. You, you know, in most places, you have to pray for good weather so Christians will show up. If you go to Florida, California, you got to pray for bad weather because otherwise everybody will go to the beach. <laughs> you know, so I think, well, it's raining, can't go to the beach, might as well go to church. So, you know, you just, it just depends on where you're at. But you start to learn to pray ahead of time. And as we prayed ahead for these meetings, we would start to dictate the things, how they would go. And we would start com com to command. The enemy will be stilled. His voice will be quiet. He will not show up. He will not make, you know, he will not manifest, uh, different things like that. And then we started seeing these manifestations and things cease, but yet we were still able to obviously cast devils out and whatever needed to be done, but we didn't have the distraction of people manifesting and devils manifesting through people in the middle of it. Uh, the, uh, had the same situation happen in, uh, up in New York when I went up there that uh, there was a, right in the opening session. I started praying, you know, and that was when I closed my eyes to pray. I don't do that anymore, uh, mainly because of situations like this. But I had closed my eyes to pray, and I was up on about a six-foot platform, and it was in a place where they actually held dances, and this is where the band played. And they had tables set up, but there was a dance floor right in the middle of it, and they wouldn't let us put tables on the dance floor, so we had this big open square. And as I started praying, just the opening prayer, first day, first session, opening prayer, and right in the middle of it, my eyes were closed, so I didn't know this woman had got up and walked to the middle of that dance floor and just started screaming, I hate you, I hate you. And just, so obviously you stop and open your eyes and see what's going on. You think, do I know you? Have we ever met somewhere? You know, why would you hate me? You don't even know me, you know? And so... I'm standing there and there's that minute where you don't know what to do, you know, just because you're not used to it. And so I'm just standing there and she's saying this stuff and then she stops and I remember and that's whenever the Holy Spirit kicked in. And all of a sudden I'm like, that all you got? That's it? Nothing else? And she just stand there. And so I jumped down off the platform, walked over in front of her and I'd never done this before. But when I walked over in front of her, 
I just stood there because I, and you have to remember, I didn't have anybody train me in a lot of this stuff. But the way I was trained was I got the videos of the early guys, Jack Coe, A. Allen, those people, and William Branham, different people. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit will bring those situations out that they experienced right at the right time so you'll know what to do. And so I remembered the story during this time, and we're talking about split second. I remember the story of how a man came into a building, pulled a gun on William Branham, and was going to shoot him. And they were going to rush on him and try to grab him. And William Branham said, nope, stop. This isn't about this. This is a battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And Branham walked up to him and he said, and he said, you will bow your knee to the name of Jesus. And whenever he did, this man stood there for a bit and the man broke, dropped down his knees, started crying, dropped the gun. They took him off. And it was, um, it was a display, right? a demonstration. And so here I am. I jumped off the platform, go down in front of this woman. I don't know what to do, but all I can remember is that William Branham story. So I look at her and I say, in the name of Jesus, you will bow your knee to the name of Jesus. We stand there, we stare at each other for a little bit. All of a sudden, it's like somebody took water and poured it over her head. It was like sweat literally poured. I'd never seen anyone instantly sweat like that. And I don't think it was just sweat, but it was just like water pouring off of her. She was soaked. And so after she stood there for what seemed like a long time, apparently it was just a few seconds, but all of a sudden she started crying, dropped down on her knees and just started weeping. And then when she did, I reached over, and I'd never done this before, never done it since either, actually. And I reached over, <clears throat> probably because just before that, this was just after Easter, and I'd been watching Jesus of Nazareth. So I reached over, and I said, in the by the finger of God, I set you free, and just tapped her in the head, which there's a scene in Jesus of Nazareth, kind of like that. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm being honest with you. I'm, you know, it wasn't some supernatural, super spiritual say, it wasn't like that. I'm just remembering certain things and then I did it. And so I really, and tapped her. And when I did, she just broke. And then all of a sudden she started crying. Her face changed, her eye, everything changed. And she leaned over and grabbed me around the legs and just hugged me. And so then I stood her up and then her friend came up and that's the first motion. Her friend came up and took her back to her chair. And remember, we, I have not preached We've not done anything. All I did was open with prayer. And so as soon as she went back, I said, okay, and that's when all the adrenaline starts to kind of flood. And you're like, okay, I think it's time for a break. You know? so, well, we hadn't even done anything yet. I didn't even finish the prayer. It was halfway through a prayer. And so I went over by the, the table and I'm like, wow, Michael was there. And, and the, this, my son-in-law, Michael, he was running the camera, which he didn't push the button and record it. So, <laughs> so he's never lived that down. I never has lived that down. But, but we go over there and I'm like, wow, that was, that was different, you know. And about that time, this woman walked up, a, a totally different lady. And she said, I've been in, in these circles all my life. I've seen people cast out devils. I've seen it all. And she said, and I've seen people, you know, put the Bibles on them when they're on the ground and yell at them and do us. And she said, but I've never seen anyone cast out a devil by the love of God. And she said, I came here to check you out. She said, I'm convinced I'm in. And, and, and I looked at her, I'm like, so you're the reason this happened. <laughs> you know, this, this was all for you, you know. But it was a demonstration, and, but it was for her. Now, you know, when, later I got to talk to that woman. That woman didn't even know where she was at. When, when her friend went by to pick her up, her friend told us, she said, when I went to pick her up, she was acting a little bit different, but she got in the car and... Everything seemed okay, but she was here. And she said, when we got here, all of a sudden she started acting different. And so all that came on at that point. So uh, we've had all kinds of things. See, the, the, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're talking about principles that we apply. But we also talk about how you deal with circumstances spiritually rather than automatically going the natural route. We were in a little town called Dallas, Georgia, which we actually moved there for a bit and, and uh, helped launch a church and ministry there. And we were in Dallas, Georgia, which is just outside Atlanta. And while we were there, I was preaching in a warehouse. The people invited us there owned a business and they said, come preach in our, in our warehouse. And so we went there and did a DHT. So I taught there for the three days. And then they said, why don't we just have a church service on Sunday? Okay, so we all had a church service on Sunday. It wasn't a church at that point, but we did a church service. And so I'm preaching and I'm talking about the situation where I cast the devil out of a boy up in Canada and it was real dramatic, and it was uh, a first-time event for that, too, like that. And so I'm, I'm going through this whole thing. It's like, uh, it was, 
That day I probably went into more detail so that the story probably took a good 30, 35 minutes. I mean, just going into every detail of how this boy had come in and it was this and he was going to commit suicide and all that stuff and he, all this stuff happened, he started manifesting and we dealt with it and he, he got free and how he acted when he got free and it was over a two day period. We saw him one day and the next morning he came in and he got free that night, but the next day when he came in, we didn't even recognize him because he was so different when he came back in. And so I gave this whole story, it was a long story, and I, and I don't normally go into that much detail. And though when I finished, uh, we finished up and we had finished the church service that morning and right across the street was the First Baptist Church. And so the pastor of the First Baptist Church came over because they got done before we did, <clears throat> which is normal here too. And so they came over and he said, um, right, what, are you, what are y'all doing here? <coughs> and we said, well, we've been having these meetings. And he, he said, well, are y'all going to, is there going to be a church here? And we said, well, not, we don't think it'll be here, but yeah, we are planting a church here in the town. He said, but it's not going to be here. And I, I said, no, it, well, I don't think it'll be here. He said, well, good, because for the last 40 minutes, uh, for some reason, your PA here was broadcasting over in our church. <laughs> And he said, my whole congregation heard some story about how you cast a devil out of a boy in Canada. And now they're all asking me questions. And so, <laughs> now, that was spiritual warfare in the positive. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because they all, they, he, we had them captured. Right? We had their PA system. <laughs> so, so one of the tactics and principles you want to use is find the frequency of the PA system <laughs> in the local denominational church and sit out in the parking lot and preach. That's what you're, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. That's not, but, but God did that. We didn't know anything about that, but they had to listen to us for 40 minutes on how to cast out devils. So anyway, so again, things, strange things happen. All right, I could give you many more stories like that. Lights going out, you name it. Uh, just things happening uh, that is usually geared to get you to quit or stop. And it almost, if something's gonna happen, it almost always happens just before you get to the point yeah. Yeah. so that everybody's distracted. And especially if you're giving an, any type of altar call or uh, trying to, uh, you know, cast the net to get people saved, something will happen just before. It'll happen right whenever the conviction is the strongest so that that'll happen and it lightens the conviction and it distracts everybody. And so these are things that as you start to minister, especially that you want to go after, now, in the beginning, we purposely um, targeted things like that. We would go after it and say, this won't happen. This, it'll be like this and this. And now, even with the weather, we don't generally pray. We expect. And expectation is a higher form of faith than praying and believing every time. You get that? You start to expect. What does that mean? You expect God to go before you and to prepare the thing and to take care of things. Why? Because you're doing his business. Right? It, it's right that he do these things because you're there doing his business. So, all right, now, <clears throat> we're going to run through these real quick and then we'll talk about them in the next session. The five ways of attack are, number one, attack by combination. Now, you can write out beside that, you can just write a little initial A, B, C. A, B, C, that stands for attack by combination, right? <clears throat> now, we'll, we will go into detail on what these mean. No, the next one is A, B, D, attack by drawing. Okay? Now, that's, I'll give you a hint. Attack by drawing is what Jesus did on the cross. Right? What does that mean? That means that you're making an attack by opening yourself up so that the enemy, you're drawing the enemy in to attack you. You're giving him an opening that you know he's going to take. So it's an attack by drawing. You got that? Yeah. See, if I want the enemy to punch here, then what I have to do is I have to open my guard. If I'm always like this, he can't punch there. So what I have to do is I have to let, now I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to go like this because that'd be too obvious. You have to gradually let it open up where he thinks an opening is occurring and he'll take the shot. But you're doing it on purpose knowing that when he punches, you're ready for it so you can do what you need to do. Right? It's called attack by drawing. That's what Jesus did. The cross was an attack by drawing. He, he drew it. He made himself at a place where the enemy saw the opportunity. If you, if you read, remember whenever the enemy attacked Jesus in the beginning in, in the wilderness? 
He, he, he attacked, remember the temptation? That's an attack. Attempt, remember, temptation is an attack. You got that? Don't think of temptation as, see, if you think of temptation as a weakness on your part, see, you, you're not responsible for the temptation. You got that? You're responsible for acting on the temptation and going into sin. Because the temptation is not the sin. The sin is acting on the temptation. The enemy can tempt you. But it's not sin until you act on the temptation. You got that? And so, remember what, Je what the enemy did is that he went to Jesus and he tempted him. And then whenever Jesus withstood all three attacks of temptation, it said he left him, and the literal Greek says he left him for a better opportunity. You hear that? Now, in the King James, I think it says he left him for a better season or for another season, right? But in, in literally in the Greek, it says for a better opportunity. Why? Because he realized, I'm not getting anywhere with this. But then later, whenever he saw the opportunity, he saw a better opportunity, but it was an attack by drawing because Jesus gave him that opportunity so that the enemy would strike, which whenever he struck and had Jesus crucified, it literally meant uh, in, in military terms, they would call it a pyrrhic or a pyrrhic victory, right? What that means is that's a victory that you won, but it cost you way more than what you actually won, right? And that's what the devil did. He had that type of victory. He won, but that victory cost him much more than what the victory would have been overall. Amen. Do you see that? And so by winning, he actually sealed his own doom. And so that is a, well, that's what... Uh, usually generals look for. We want a victory, but not at a price that makes the victory not a true victory, right? We, we, want, we want a victory. We don't want to just win the battle. We want to win the war. We don't want to win a battle that cost us the war. Well, that's what Satan did. He won a battle at the cross that cost him the war. <coughs> Amen? All of this is military. So, all right, I got you go. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world.